innovation is what makes the food industry go ahead. So what are the innovations that we can expect from Barcelos to stay ahead of the competition? Um, hi, Nandine. Thanks for the invite. Nice to be here. Thanks for everybody having us here in India. Um, we're making a comeback into India for those who don't know. We uh, were here and uh, unfortunately due to um, circumstances with COVID, we had to exit and we are re returning to India. So um, looking forward to the travel. We have associated ourselves with an, an amazing team here in India and we look forward to reopening, restarting our, um, our brand again in India. Your question was um, what are competitors or what are the uh, brands today doing to stay ahead of competitors? What I would like to do is change the question a little bit to say what brands should be doing to stay ahead of competitors rather than what they are doing. And for that I'd uh, like to go back to our own story because I think over the years um, we have experienced both the good side and the difficult sides and uh, we have somewhat recovered from the difficult times and uh, today we proudly stand ready for growth but it wasn't an easy journey so I think what we went through is basically what all brands I think go through and what all of us should be striving to um, avoid and obviously to achieve. So, going back a while, um, we started uh, 30 years ago, and uh, you can imagine that 30 years ago, doing business was a little different to what it is today. In fact, it was a lot different, and we, um, what we were, it was easier those days. So, we started a little business, and uh, unexpectedly, it grew to a worldwide business, and we were very proud of that. But with that, in my opinion, came a little bit of complacency. One thing that uh, happens to many entrepreneurs, whereby they don't see the, the competition coming, they don't see the difficulties coming. And of course, when things are going easy, then we relax, take the eye off the ball. And uh, that very much happened with us. So we were doing well, we were growing, and suddenly came the, not only the, 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 the threat of, of COVID that took everybody in the whole world by surprise, but obviously at the same time, it meant that many companies had either, they, they either had to uh, uh, relook at themselves and revitalize themselves, or else they wouldn't have survived the moment of COVID. And it was no different to us. So we went through a difficulty and a difficult time in uh, adjusting. Um, and suddenly the, the, the technology, technology uh, world came into play. And before we, we realized, we were sitting somewhere on the back burner where other more innovative brands had come and taken the, 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 the front stage and we were sort of left wondering what we're going to do. So it took exceptional hard work, it took exceptional uh, uh, thinking outside the box, embracing new technology for us to be able to survive the difficult times and unfortunately, many other brands all over uh, they didn't quite make it. But we seem to have survived the, 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 those times fairly easily, purely because of us having adopted uh, what was important to, to, to uh, take into account and how the world was changing. So technology for me and for my team back home was the key cornerstone of what we had to take into account for us to, to move on and to have stayed the course. And of course with technology and me being the, uh, the elder of the crowd, of the team, 
wasn't as easy for me to, to uh, get my head around. But luckily we had young, in, uh, innovative uh, uh, youngsters in the team and they came up with all sorts of clever ideas of how to, uh, to move the brand and turn it around. And of course, with that came all the apps that, that, that exist today and all the uh, delivery methods that, that suddenly became an important part of our lives, which wasn't there before, at least not to the extent that it happened when, uh, when COVID uh, uh, struck. So I think the, the youngsters of today were very wise and, and, and uh, were able to, to take a brand that needed assistance and turn it around with all the important factors that the world naturally evolved to and we were not quite seeing it or at least we weren't prepared for it. So point of sale systems that uh, tell you a lot of it, give you a lot of information, um, knowing your customer, your needs of your customers, that's what's got to, what, what we've got to know, we've got to take into account um, uh, delivery services, uh, uh, siding up with, with, with partners that understand technology and can add value to our system, something that was very difficult for me to get my head around because I thought I knew uh, most of, the, uh, of what needed to be done. But I was pleasantly surprised that there was so much more that could have been added. So technology for me has been a turnaround for us. Anything to do with technology from from apps to marketing in the, in the digital uh, uh, sector, something that uh, we used to, in the old days, uh, advertise in newspapers and uh, pamphlets, if you remember, that's gone, obviously tech, uh, the, 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 the uh, tech world has taken over and all the, uh, the advertising now is done on social media with huge response. So, Technology as a whole, I think that's where the world's going. That's where the new brands are, are uh, excitedly moving into. I think there's a lot of youngsters that are coming up with fantastic ideas of how to market their product. The other thing that we found about uh, what changed in the last couple of years is obviously raining in on your overheads. Size of stores are no longer what they need to be. The, the, the large outlets, the sit-down outlets, is some of the past. People want convenience, people want speed, and of course we have uh, uh, looked into our stores and, and uh, uh, reduced size, reduced kitchen size, improved on equipment. I think that's an important factor of, of, of instead of having old-fashioned equipment, look around to see what it is that is available in the market, so all those together is what makes the complete picture to turn a brand around. So everybody that's in the space today that's maybe finding it difficult to, to uh, stay up with competitors, especially the younger competitors, the competitors who are uh, afraid with uh, technology, they certainly need to look at minimizing uh, space, in, in improving on tech, or what, they can, uh, what they can use to, to assist them. So generally, it's all a matter of turning to the new way of doing things, accepting that the old ways are not always right. That's a difficult part for us uh, older folks to accept because we always think that the youngsters don't know as much as we do. But indeed, it is a, a tech world we're living in and restauranteering hasn't been spared from that. It needs to be advanced to that level where uh, customer uh, service is at a peak, speed is at a peak, uh, convenience for the customer is at a peak, and those are the brands I think that are gonna survive the competitors as well as the, the new world that's, that's facing us and is getting faster and faster as we get on, as we go every day. So that's my little take on um, what I think compet uh, restaurants should be doing to avoid the competitors and to survive. It's not only avoiding competitors, it's also for survival because it's just 
too technical and too advanced today for, for us to run the old-fashioned way. Thank you so much, Paul. I think he uh, did the entire panel discussion by himself. You've given us all the points. So I'll have to change questions for the rest of my panelists. <laughs> so Paul, uh, Smoothie Factory is all about eco-friendly systems and everything. So my question is two-part. One, how are you incorporating an eco-friendly uh, sustainable practices in both operation and you know, the entire thing that you're expanding? And secondly, how does a sustainable operation affect the revenue of the company? Thank you, Nandini. And thank you, Mr. Costa, for taking up most of the time. <laughs> I'm so glad I was actually talking to him and saying, I'm a bit nervous of speaking. And he said, if anything, he will take over my time. <laughs> so thanks, Costa. Yeah, so coming back to your question, and that's a great question. And from my experience, I will uh, narrate a little bit of story here. This year is actually very pivotal, right? It's a year where it's like a canvas where we can paint the picture of eye growth industries. It's a future of the eye growth industries bolstered by pronounced investment. Just like the presentation, Mr. of the postcard presentation we had heard, they are looking at, and a lot of investors are getting on board. And the food industry is actually on the heart of that canvas. So, where Smoothie Factory is coming into play, is we where we were started about in 1995, and we've been there for the 25 years. And uh, it was all about uh, nutritious eating and sustainable. We were always promoting that. So what has happened now in recent times? So we sort of, we, the sustainable practices is was always employed by us. So what we have done different in our markets is uh, if there is like reusable cups is very important, right? So we've got a program where we got where we can uh, we make fresh juices, packages in bo bottles, and then the customers come and we either deliver or they pick it up from the store. But we got because the customers were coming again and again. They thought, okay, why don't we bring in our own cups? So the idea clicked and we said, okay, so if the customers are conscious about sustainability, then we need to encourage those customers. So the future of the industry is all about sustainability. In today's world, if every food we bite, the customers and everybody is being very conscious because they are looking at not only the environment, because they want to have a good f footprint on the environment, and they want to do their own uh, uh, part for the environment, because it's all about being green. Like Mr. Kapil Chopra rightly mentioned, and I saw his presentation, and I was so impressed. All he said, it's all is about this uh, experience which is being created in order to sell so I strongly believe the future is about experiences, creating the experiences. And what about the revenue? How much does the sustainable practices and operation affect the revenue? Yeah, that is a big challenge the businesses are facing because anything which has to be changed, a bigger investment is required, right? But what the way uh, business can and, uh, and brands can change by pitching to global investors saying that it's a long-term investment. It's not a return on investment straight away. So when, because the world is moving towards health conscious, everybody's becoming eco-friendly con consumers. So if we start encouraging, you'll also have those repeat customers coming on board. That's a great point. So, uh, Mr. Shindivas, hey. so your oral, oral or oral, how do I say? Oral. Oral. Oral foods is all about ready to eat. Yes, yes. So, how are you adapting yes. to the industry changes with the consumer becoming more and more aware about the sustainable, eco-friendly practices and is demanding food and ready to eat food without any preservatives? So, how are you adapting yourself? 
Yeah, I, uh, like uh, it's pleasure to uh, shed light on uh, this fascinating topic, which resonates each and every human being. Like uh, food is uh, been the which uh, resonates uh, all the human beings. Uh, like uh, as we stand on the cusp of the technology advancement and we face challenges towards uh, sustainability, health and global food practices. So here uh, it's very crucial to envision and uh, uh, embrace the needs of nutritional uh, facts which we needed for the future consignments. And even the, even the food industry, it has been, uh, the journey has been very pivotal and it was about to reach almost uh, $535 billion uh, uh, by 2025. So it's really crucial for us to take these uh, considerations about the sustainability, health, and other factors which we needed from consumer point of view. And uh, when we talk about this convenience food also, it's not uh, about any uh, innovative recipes or uh, exhaustive uh, ingredients. It's all about how we produce, consume, and perceive the food. So when, uh, when we have the challenge of uh, these all three aspects, uh, then the, and even the consumer behavior towards uh, achieving these things, uh, even the consumers, how they are uh, taking considerations about this uh, convenience food, like uh, the demand, why the demand has been created because of the busyness and uh, like uh, we can save time, energy using this convenience food. The demand for being this convenience food has been very pivotal. And we ourselves as witness uh, like, uh, very, uh, uh, like a, a very uh, interesting uh, change in our numbers, like we are able to hit uh, 80 crores of revenue in the span of two years. And uh, that is the beauty of this convenience food. And uh, coming to like uh, market shares and how these uh, convenience food is affecting almost uh, taking the major trajectory of the food industry basically. So when we talk about the future and when we take about the previous statistics what you have. For example, if you take about the small food item, which is curd, we will be using every day in our daily life. See, when we take about around a decade back, we to prepare a curd, we used to get the milk, boil, do the fermentation and get. Now, how the curd is used? We are going and getting the curd packets easily. That's a convenience food. We have seen a very beautiful uh, uh, trajectory in this one, and uh, the market share, uh, if you talk about the curd, right now it is going to hit around $3,000 billion by 2028. The, that is the beauty of convenience food, how it has been impacted the market share. Lovely. Thank you so much. So, Costa, we come back to you. <laughs> so, tell us how this uh, continuous changing consumer behavior is going to affect our um, restaurant outings and nightlife? The, I think the most important point that, uh, that has changed, especially since COVID, uh, over and above, I think, I think COVID purely um, hastened or brought into effect what was already happening, but in a slower uh, uh, pace, was the expectation by the customer for convenience. So once COVID uh, arrived, that expectation just grew exponentially purely because the convenience expectation just was there by default, right? People had to order, they had to sit at home, they weren't allowed to go out. So the, 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 the ordering from restaurants, the delivering suddenly be, be, it grew immensely, purely out of necessitation. It was necess necessary. So from that point of view, from that time on, I think the public, the customer, purely grew even more used to expect expecting the, the deliveries. So ease of, of, of eating became a lot uh, more... Um, uh, more uh, expected by the consumer than it was before. So I think at this stage, it's affecting the restaurants, hence the reason that I said earlier that one needs to decrease size, one needs to take into account the fact that you're not going to have as many customers coming to the restaurants as there were before, so smaller um, locations are, are needed. Um, I've, we've seen many restaurants that had huge footprints cutting down space and, create, and, and, and um, implementing second brands in these spaces purely so that they can reduce space uh, uh, costs. So expectation by the customer 
for convenience is the key driver today for the future which we believe and of course that comes with other challenges which is your delivery services your apps your uh, menus the digital menus and not necessarily card menus and of course once again all um, tech related uh, points that one has to uh, um, adhere to and uh, get used to so customer reliance on uh, on deliveries lovely paul i have an out of syllabus question for you i didn't share this so what advice would you give to an early stage restaurant company seeking growth capital seeking growth capital so basically an early stage company trying to seek capital need to prove they need to use data driven strategies to prove to the uh, to the investor to prove to the investors that they, that they can that the the trend is going towards eco friendly not only the businesses but consumers they are wanting more eco friendly and sustainable practices businesses which employ that so we need to with data we need to prove to them now for just to give you an example like we are trying to pitch for investors over here and yesterday we had a great turnout of investors all entrepreneurs and we had a lot of investors and we had about 150 leads we actually spoke to them and most of them and i was able to relate a personal story to them what happened was few about few years ago about 7 8 years ago i had the smoothie factory brand but i had a lot of weight and i used to play a lot of hockey and i had put about 91 kilos i had a lot of knee pains and uh, with my knee pains i was I was actually contemplating knee replacement, right? But one of my son is a doctor, and you know, usually the parent will never go to the son to ask for advice. So uh, around 2019, I went to my son and I said, son, can you recommend me a doctor who, where I can go for my knee replacement because I'm struggling to even walk? And he looked at me and he said, dad, don't you own a smoothie factory franchise? And I said, yeah, but I'm in sales. I don't know the operations. I don't know what's cooking in the kitchen. He said, go and look into the menu. And this is coming from my son. He said, dad, it's all about healthy eating. You're promoting something, but you're not even practicing. So actually, in 2020, I went in and I had a look at it. And you won't believe it. There was all these health options in there. So, and he said, all you have to do is to start eating it. And you will, and then you can actually sell it if you don't. You need to practice before you preach. So I started drinking the smoothies. And then, of course, I had to do all the other stuff, like uh, going to the gym, walking, and everything. And, in within a, and the main thing I did was give up sugar. And in our products, there is no sugar at all. And you won't believe it, I've actually lost 10 kilos. And end of about nine months, I could actually squat. So now I can actually squat and I, on my way from Sydney to here, I came through Vietnam and I did a tour and there are those uh, caves. I was able to crawl through the caves and I actually crawled 60 meters. So coming back to your point, and I was able to narrate this story to my investors over there. And most of them were impressed by that story. So, and I was trying to pitch them, this is the future of the, if you take our business, that is what the health conscious people are looking at. And I'm being at a, even at the age of 57, I can even run with a 30 year old. And that's very important. So this is where the future of the industry is going. Fantastic. And it's a lovely personal growth story as well. So uh, Srinivas, yes. tell us about the trends that you foresee in the ready to eat, ready to cook genre of the food industry. Uh, yes, when we're talking about the food industry as it as a major shore holder uh, compared to any other industries, like uh, we will be eating every day, we need to cook every day. And coming to the like how the transformation from uh, traditional cooking style to ready to eat, ready to cook because of the uh, busyness of uh, and uh, time constraints and uh, time saving and energy saving factors. Uh, consumers are sort of preferring to have this ready to cook and ready to eat meals. And uh, apart from this, the consumers 
Sasha has the insights about like uh, how healthier it is and uh, getting these two ready to cook meals and ready to eat uh, in the segment of healthier things. Uh, and it's like uh, now the consumers, it has been a test mate kind of thing while uh, choosing these factors. And uh, these have a major impact on uh, you know, sourcing of the ingredients kind of thing uh, to how the food is being manufactured. Everything has an impact on uh, how the food has been uh, calculated to get it to cater to the, uh, from a traditional way to the ready to cook meal. So it has been a major trend from a traditional to the uh, ready to cook meal. And uh, coming to the insights like what we have seen right now today, like uh, when I spoke about the curd, uh, how many billion dollars it has taken. And uh, like this, uh, coming to other uh, uh, aspects of, uh, from uh, uh, like our we manufacture of uh, chutneys kind of thing. We have a lot of things like uh, from instant noodles kind of thing we have. And these is marketing about around uh, thousands and billions of uh, dollars in India. And, uh, and uh, even apart from uh, other countries. And uh, coming to these uh, aspects, how the consumers is uh, uh, interested from uh, when they talk about any ready to cook meal, when then they uh, consumer thinks whether it is healthier or not. So uh, practicing these healthier uh, practices in the, and the sustainability and the growth of these things is very pivotal. And uh, the major reason why uh, we need to go for uh, investments in the ready to cook foods is three things like uh, even uh, apart from the growing uh, of the economy and from the farmers to the distributor dealers enter the supply chain management and uh, it will have the impact on the global trends. Mainly when we tr change from traditional food to this ready to cook meal, we can save time, money and energy. <laughs>